the corner, Barry. Rick Barry has not missed a free throw against Washington. Now it is Barry. Back to Clifford Ray. Goes to Rick Barry. Golden State getting that ball moving. Intended for Barry. Barry, look at that pass. Rick Barry, look at that shot, would you? You want answers? I think I'm entitled. You want answers? I want the truth. You can't handle the truth. Barry wants to make a move. There's a Barry. He's got his shot. Everybody, Rick Barry here on Warriors 24 with my partner in crime, Cyrus Hatchis. Uh, we're calling him Moses now uh, for short. Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit later on about the Golden State Warriors with the, a huge win that they had in last night's game. It was pretty cool. We'll talk more about that. But I'm really delighted to have someone on who's a fellow coach with me now in the big three, uh, which I just I think I heard that they may be we may be coming back this uh, this summer. Uh, Michael Cooper from uh, the Los Angeles Lakers coaching in the big three uh, ice cubes league that we're having a lot of fun in doing. And uh, he was uh, obviously a product of. Uh, of California, right? Pasadena High School, man. Yeah, Pasadena High School, junior college in Pasadena. And then he wandered off not too far away over to New Mexico. And then uh, he was the 60th pick by the Los Angeles Lakers and had an illustrious clear with them from 1978 to 1991, which is a long time to be with any one team, and especially in today's world of professional sports. And uh, He's had a hell of a coaching career as well. He's coached all over the place. We're going to talk a little bit about that, but let's welcome in Michael Cooper. Oh, Rick, thank you for having me, man. A great introduction. Hey, pleasure. No, well, it, you know, there's a lot to be talking about. And I got a lot of questions I'm going to ask you, things I've never really asked you before, because I think it'd be important for people to, to learn a little bit about what goes on in the mind of a player and the things that he has to deal with. Uh, I know in my case, I almost quit basketball in high school because of the coach that I had. Uh, I don't know if you've had, did you have any really experiences with coaches? Because everybody hears these stories about the wonderful things these coaches do. But for every one of those, there seems to be one that's a, like a nightmare for a lot of guys. So how was your situation growing up with the various coaches you had? No, well, terrible like yours, Rick. I remember uh, the Y team had initiated some practices. So I went down myself and my cousin and uh, his name was Mr. Kelly. I'll never forget this guy. But on the eighth grade team, Rick, I was probably the most athletic as far as running and real fast, uh, get, still learning basketball. This guy kept me on the bench, kept me on the bench, wouldn't play me unless it was a blowout. Either way, it, we were being blown out or we blown out the other team. But the fu funny part about it, and this is what made me mad, is that at least I got to play. And he had two kids. He had two sons. And they played, uh, one played Pop Warner baseball and the other one was Pop Warner football. And as soon as they came, they usually came back right before the middle of the season. As soon as they came back, he put me on the bench and I never played anymore. So I remember my uncle telling me uh, one day he would come to the games every Saturday and I'd get in a little bit here, a little bit there. And uh, he said, man, are you OK? I said, you know, no, I'm not doing good. I'm going to change sports now. And he said, and I, his name is Tom, but I can't refer to him as Uncle Tom. I'm supposed to say Tom, yeah, my yeah, uncle. You can't, you can't say that, yeah. <laughs> So he told me, he said, you know what? Don't ever let anybody steal your joy. If this is what you want to do, then you got to tough it out, man, because this is one coach that you're going to see of many. He um, had a, lo a little stint in the Negro Baseball League. So when he told me that, I fought my way through the rest of that summer. It was probably about another eight or ten games. But I never forgot that lesson that I learned from him. And that coach and you know as we go and i'm pretty sure your story kind of like mine you see different coaches so now i'm able to pass that along to young kids now who are struggling with coaches like my son struggled with his aau coach this guy was a screamer he would yell get in their face and i didn't like it but you know what he wanted to play for that team so i said man you gotta stick it out now you're not gonna quit and he stayed so now he's able to adjust and to adapt to different coaches. But yeah, that was, that was my nemesis then. And I always remember his name. So whenever I got down on myself, I go, Mr. Kelly, Mr. Kelly. And I know I bounce back. See, that, it's really interesting, isn't it? How, what kind of an impact coaches can have on you? You have this as such a vivid memory from so far back. Same as me. I had a screamer and a holler. I mean, he was just, he was crazy. Yeah. And my, my father and my brother had to talk me into not doing it. My son Canyon went through something like that in high school where the coach had his own son on the team and wanted his son to be the guy. And, and so he didn't even start, even though he was probably the best player on the team. I mean, so, and I said, you know what, son, and you probably heard the same thing from your guy. 
Is it fair? No. Should you be starting? Yes. I said, so what are you going to do? Feel sorry for yourself? Or are you going to go out and play well enough to force him to have to play you? And so obviously that's what he did and he got through it. But I, I've heard so many stories from other guys. In fact, I even thought sometime about writing a book and getting stories like yours and other people. So people realize there's always two sides to every coin. Right? <laughs> That'd be a great book. The coach I hate or the coach that yeah. made me, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and you learn a lot of things from that stuff. It's really, it's, it's, it's pretty cool to be honest with you. So, so, okay. So we got that out of the way. That's what happened for you. As far as going and growing up and going through the, the, the ranks, high school, then on to college, junior college, and then college. What coach had the most impact on you? Let's just say, first of all, for helping you with your basketball first. Uh, would be my, my high school coach, Coach George Turgeon. And he just passed away about three years ago, two years ago. And I miss him to this day, but he was the first one that initiate that uh, fellowship FCA, the fellowship Christian athlete. Right. I didn't know you could be a Christian and praise the Lord and do both of those. I mean, I knew it, but I didn't know how to put that together. But he was the first coach that really identified basketball for me as far as being a good defensive player. He set the foundation because all we worked on was footwork, Rick, uh, drop step, reverse pivot, forward pivot, left, right, all that. And you know what? I thought it was kind of mundane when we're going through it and it's just silly and why are we doing this? But you know what? That has really saved my ass many times on the court in college and in the pros because, you know, you, the, the, the little foot of reverse pivot can get you through a screen. A good forward pivot can get you open for your jump shot. And I'm pretty sure you got some stories you can tell too, but he was the first one to introduce me to the fundamentals of the game. That's how you play, how to dribble. Uh, I was just a right-handed dribbler. Many of us were, but he taught me how to really, really work on that left hand, gave me drills to do that on my own. And he was such an amazing man. Rick, I've had a lot of coaches that cursed and screamed. This man never one time, and I used to watch him from the ninth grade to the 12th grade. And I didn't play varsity. He was just a varsity coach. I didn't play varsity till the summer of my 11th grade going into my 12th grade year. But we were always connected because JV practiced along with varsity or right before or after. He would always come in and watch us. This man never, ever cursed. Never said a, a curse word. And you know what, Rick? At the time, I didn't realize that. But now I went through Norm Ellenberger, who was, I call you anything under the sun. Uh, that was amazing to me that he never really cursed. And I mean, that, that really takes hold to me now because that's kind of what I put into my coaching style. You know, you don't have to curse to get anything out of him. I think you have to be demanding, but he was never, never cursed. And that was always amazing to me. Well, this is so great to listen to what you're talking about because Cyrus knows he's heard me many times on the shows that we've done. The one thing I stress all the time and tell parents and stuff, fundamentals, fundamentals, fundamentals. So you have the base to build on. Obviously, this is what that, that man did for you. He put it, he put, the, he gave you all of the necessary information to learn and gave you the fundamentals of the game, which enabled you to maximize that athleticism and everything that you had to utilize it in the best way possible. So it's great hearing, you know, hearing that, knowing that you had someone like that that, you know, could help you along. Um, yeah, I, I'm happy to hear that because this is like, I feel like you're preaching to the choir when you're talking about this stuff to me. So, okay, so that's cool. So now you go through it. What was your experience like when you didn't necessarily get a chance to get a Division One scholarship and you had to go to JUCO? What was going through your head at that time? Well, Rick, you know what? I'm, I'm, a, I'm a true believer about this concept that we kind of lose, uh, lose in. It, is, it, Rick, when we were coming up, I'm pretty sure many people you know, it was we were athlete students. You know, we had put all our eggs in one basket and that was going to be it. And what I learned to be a student athlete was because in, the, in high school, Rick, I wasn't really big in the classroom. I knew my basketball skills were good enough. And again, my family didn't have a lot of money to send me to a four year college and pay for it. So athletics was going to be the way for me. So uh, all I did was get what I call Coop's five D's. They are determination, dedication, desire, discipline and decision making. And what I tell kids about that is that was my report card, all D's, because all I had to do was stay eligible. I didn't have, we didn't have to have a, uh, what they have now, uh, what is it, 2.7, 3.0, or whatever it is. All I had to do was just stay eligible to play basketball. And in doing that, my grades suffered in high school. And Rick, I had one college scholarship, uh, and it was to Seattle Pacific. 
And I had never heard of Seattle Pacific. I didn't know where it was. I didn't know the state of Washington, I, nothing. So that is why I opted to go to junior college because I wanted to stay close to home. And I kept asking my coach because he was always calling certain players into the office and talking to them. And I would ask my teammate, I said, what's coach talking to you about? Well, he's, he's uh, letting us know about this school, this school, because it's a scholarship for them. They want to offer them a scholarship. And he never called me in, Rick, never called me in. And I, one day I went up and asked him, I said, coach, you're calling all these guys. How come you call them in? I'm averaging about 14 points. I wasn't a star on my team, but I was an integral part. And he said, Coop, you know what? The colleges don't think that you can make it in the classroom. So they're not going to waste time on you like that. And that's when I turned that concept around of being an athlete student, to be a student athlete. Those five Ds that I just mentioned, determination, dedication, desire, discipline, decision-making had made me a pretty good basketball player. I was skinny. People told me I would never make it. I put that into my student life and started determined to be a better student, dedicated to be a better student, have this, all the things that I did for basketball, I started applying that to my uh, academic work. And the two years I spent, and Rick, you know, people make a lot of fun out of a JUCO. Sometimes if you use JUCO the right way, it can help you. And that really shored up my academic process. And that's where New Mexico found me. So uh, I always say student athlete first, and, you know, because you got to, my coach used to tell me, use basketball before basketball uses you. Yeah, that, well, that's great stuff. And it's great to hear because you obviously were like me. You were a late developer physically. You weren't some big, strong Adonis like LeBron James was in high school. <laughs> <laughs> you were just this, you know, skinny little guy hoping that somebody didn't, you know, you know break your bones. Uh, so I can certainly relate to that, but boy, that's, that, that's a great lesson for, for kids to listen to. And you have to have, you have to have this kind of discipline to be able to do the right things. And so that's kind of a cool thing that you do. My thing is the same thing. You use the five D's. I use pride, taking pride in what you do. And it comes into it. Dedication is one of them. Determination for D all of the things you were mentioning with your D's. And then I throw a couple of other things in there. Mm -hmm. So any of the younger people listening or those of you who are listening, who have children, these are the kind of things that you need to, I, I think, to talk to them about and get them to understand it that their number one priority should always be their education. It really should be because you have to have something to fall back on because the odds are so much against you of becoming a professional athlete because there are millions of kids out there with those same ambitions. So you'd have to be prepared to do something else in life. And so if you do that, it certainly will help you, but it's also going to help you if you apply yourself in the classroom to be able to understand and study and learn the game and play the game the right way. I, Coop, I, I have, I don't know about you. I have a hard time watching a lot of basketball these days. Oh yeah, I, I have that same feeling. I mean, and you're a coach, so I, I can't even imagine what, you know, what we're going through. I mean, you learned the fundamentals. I knew the fundamentals. I was taught that by my dad and other coaches. And to see these guys go out there and do some of the bonehead things that they do and not play team basketball, it's painful for me. It really truly is. So, okay, let's get back to your story. So now you're playing at the JUCO and you're studying and becoming a good student. When did you find out that you were going to have the opportunity to go off and go to a division one school? And how did you feel about that? Well, once I got things done in the classroom, uh, uh, it seemed like Rick, it works hand in hand because when you're doing things off the court, it helps you on the court. So again, with my studies and, and, and really trying to pay attention to that and become a good student in the classroom, helped me on the court. So uh, it, it, it's funny because my freshman year, I was, I was, that's when I became academically ineligible. And that really came to a head, but that's another story in itself. But once I got back onto the court, uh, I, we had lost a lot of players, Rick, on our team. So the coach kind of like built the team around me. So my sophomore year, and what this is what people don't realize, they, they see me as a defensive player. Rick, I averaged 27 points a game in college in my sophomore year. Uh, we were playing, I played against Dennis Johnson, the late, great Dennis Johnson for the Celtics. I played against him because Dennis went to a ju JUCO too. He went to uh, Harbor College. So I had an opportunity to play against a lot of players, but that's where I really kind of like felt myself on the offensive end. And that got the notice of, uh, just to name a couple, uh, the Running Rebels with Tark when he was there, uh, the great teams they had up there. Uh, I chose New Mexico because what happened to them, University in, in Albuquerque, is that they had a social injustice issue in Albuquerque and the team was loaded with a lot of uh, black players. All the black players walk off and leave. So when it came our time to get drafted, 
He had nine spots open, Rick, at a Division I major school at the Pitt, the Lobo, nine spots open. He went out and recruited seven JUCO All-Americans, all of us. When we all got there, he sat us all down. He said, listen, you guys are good, and I'm going to coach you to be better, but I'm not telling you who's a starter. I'm going to throw the ball up and whoever wants the most, the first five. And that's how, we, that's how I got my starting spot. I just outworked everybody else. And again, it all goes back to when – I was skinny and everybody said, you don't have a jump shot. This is, I'm a 10th grader in school. Coop, you're too skinny. I weighed like 130 pounds, Rick. And in my pro years, when I played the professional, I played at 176 pounds, man. So, hey, I mean, you know, like that. I was 175. Yeah, so <laughs> I weighed more than you, Rick. <laughs> hey, don't, the owner of the Knicks, they asked him why he didn't draft me. And he said, because I, he, I was too skinny and flaky. Now I said, no, you know, he may be right, but I didn't appreciate him saying that. And I'll tell you what. <laughs> That's great fuel for the fire to go. I had a lot of great games against the Knicks because I never forgot what he said about it. <laughs> you know, don't judge a book by its cover. You know what I mean? Exactly. Like, Perfect. Right. Perfectly <laughs> said. Look at the Iceman. Right. You know, I mean, come on. He wasn't any big bruising kind of guy. I mean, he was a skinny hey, old rail. Rick, you know who I looked at? Is, is who would play? Remember Charlie Scott from UNC? Oh, yes, Charlie exactly. Scott was rail thing. Oh, yeah. For sure. I use Charlie as my example. I said, this guy can play in the pros. I know I can get there. Exactly. I mean, that's exactly right. So cool. And you're I just you're not the first guy that I've talked to who was an offensive player. You know, Bob Love's another guy that was known for defense. Bob Love was the scorer, and then he finally got a chance to do it. And that's a whole nother story. I should get Bob on the on the on the show one of these times because the story that he hated me because I got him cut from the Cincinnati Royals oh. in exhibition season because I lit him up. And he was supposed to be there. As a <laughs> no, it's it's a cool story. Bob's a great guy, but but the other guy that was supposed to be the defensive guy, and he, I mean, he, and then he eventually showed that he could score. Now, of course, in your situation, now you go through, you get a chance to finally play in Division One. What did you feel like when you finally found out that you were drafted by by the Lakers? And did you really, honestly, in your heart, believe you had a chance to make the team, being picked sixtieth? Well, let me say this, Rick. First, when I get to New Mexico, we had a guy on our team named Marvin Johnson. He was from Florida. I mean, this kid could score like you, Rick, in college. This guy was, I mean, he got 50 points in a game back then before the three-point line. But I was just a defensive player, so people weren't looking at me. They were all looking at him and this other guy on our team named Willie Howard. Willie was about 6'8", a jumper out of the gym. But people were coming to see them, asking the coach about them. And I, I'll never forget this. Jerry West, who loves golf, came down there one time and uh, was looking at uh, talking to Coach Ellenberger. And uh, when he leaves, I, you know, he introduced him. Hey, Mike, this is Jerry West. You know, I'm excited. He says he go, he's at the game tonight and he's going to be watching Marvin Johnson. So I said to myself, Rick, I said, you know what? If he's here to see Marvin, let me have a good game. And, you know, make myself known. And that particular game that we played against Colorado, I had 20 points, 15 boards, 10 rebounds. I mean, 10, uh, uh, th 10, 8 or 10 assists. But I had a big game. And that's how I got noticed. So I finally, but I never really thought that I could, I knew I could play, but I never thought the reality would become a reality. So Rick, the night of the draft, coming out of college, I went back home. And the draft night, and everybody, all my friends were like, Coop, you gonna watch the draft? Listen to the draft. No, I'm gonna go. I went to the park. I was playing basketball. At about 7.15 that night, my friends came to the gym and they go, Coop. I said, Well, you said the Lakers drafted you. I said, What? Man, stop playing. You get out of here. I said, No, 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 serious. You gotta come home. Jerry West is gonna call you. I said, man, stop playing with me. So anyway, I get home, Rick, and that was my reality. And that, at that phone call was when I knew that, okay, if there's a chance that they would draft me, because I thought I was going to go either go back east or wasn't going to get drafted at all. I really didn't think I was going to get drafted. So right there, that set that fire and got that pride in me going. And I said, you know what? Hey, if, they, if I can get drafted, maybe there's a good chance that I might be able to stick. And that's that at that moment is when, okay, I, let, I think I can play professional, but I had no inkling of it. No thoughts of seeing myself in the league or anything. Well, my guest uh, here, Michael Cooper, a great player for the Los Angeles Lakers for a dozen years or so coach uh, having some fun talking here on Warriors 24 with my 
cohort in crime, Cyrus Satchez, who has some mic issues. So that's why he's not speaking up a lot. We're going to bring him in a little bit, though. So would you like to throw something in here now? Or you want to let me keep rolling, Cyrus? Well, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just jump in. If I, feel, I mean, I guess my one question I want to ask right off top, top of the bat is you, you two, your careers overlapped a little bit. Um, did you ever face each other head on? And what was that like? I don't think we ever played against each other, Rick. You, but, you, Cyrus, when, did you, when did you start? I came in in 79, 1979. Yeah. Yeah, that was my last. That was my last last year, uh, seventy nine, eighty uh, with the Rockets. See, but and, I got hurt in yeah. summer league, so I really I was on the team in seventy nine, but I didn't play. I played like the last six games of the season. I remember, I remember the that game that I remember the most is Washington Bullets. We went there, and I ran into <laughs> a kick with Wes Unsell, and that is my glory, <laughs> my glory to the introduction to basketball. <laughs> we kind of did play against each other, even though we're, my last year was your first year in the. Uh, okay. Yes, but here's what you were smart about doing. Okay, now I'll get back to you in a second, Cyrus. Sorry. Okay. Because my my thought process is going on here. The beauty of it is, and this is a good example for people to understand, when you go to play in a team sport, sometimes you have to put your ego in the closet. Yeah. You knew that you could go out and score points, but you also realize some of the guys that are on that Lakers team, they didn't need you to score. <laughs> right? I mean, they didn't need you to get twenty a game for them to be able to win. They had. Rick, a I say that. That's what kept me in the league. I didn't have to score. They got Kareem, Jamal Wilkes. Uh, who else was on that team? Uh, Magic eventually came. We had Lou Hudson. My first year we got there. Ron Boone. All the guys could score. Exactly. So you were able to take advantage of and provide something that these other guys were not as proficient at as you were, which made your mark, which was really smart on your part. What was your high game in, in the NBA scoring? Rick, I scored uh, 31 twice. I did it against the Celtics one time, and then I remember I did it against, I think it was the Trailblazers. Magic was out, had, had tore his finger or broke his finger in 81 or something like that. But I started for seven games, and I averaged uh, 25 points a game. And the only reason I averaged 25 points a game because we had Kareem. So every time I threw the ball into him, they would go, leave Cooper, go get double Kareem. So I was always <laughs> shooting open jump shots. <laughs> <laughs> Not like you, Rick. I, I didn't have to fight off two people and still score. I was out there. The invisible man was guarding me. It's easy to shoot over him. <laughs> okay. uh, folks, uh, let me just tell you something. You're playing, I don't care where you're playing basketball, what level is doing something. If you could ever score 30 points in one game, you're doing something that a very small percentage of people are ever going to do. Okay. So let's not play it down, Coop. You had the ability to be able to do that, but your key was playing that defense. So on that note, Give me your top three most difficult guys to guard in third, second, first. Great question. Oh, wow. That is tough. Uh, my third would be Michael Jordan. And the reason third. Michael People Jordan are gonna is say, Wait third. a second. Third, third Michael Jordan? What are you kidding me? Go ahead. I can't wait to hear this. Third, listen, uh, Michael really became a, a hell of a player. I mean, he became the legendary player. He came as he got older in his career but earlier Michael was so athletic and you know that, that's all you had to defend when he had the basketball he was going to either jump over you or go around you well he wasn't going around me because I was just as fast as him so he would just back me down and turn around fall away jump shot I could contest that get my hand up so I mean he still scored his points but I would make him take the kind of shots that I wanted him to take fall away jumper well, I can live with that if he's hitting that shot there so that's why Michael became what's the third to me. Yeah, well, and he wasn't a great shooter when he first came in the league. Exactly. See, everything was dunk with his tongue wagging and all that. So he, I wasn't going to give him those. No. Uh, my, my second person uh, would be George Gervin. Mm -hmm. And the reason why George was so good, because he was real thin like me. And I mean, it was like, it was like almost guarding yourself in a mirror image. But the Iceman was probably the most proficient and the efficient scores that I've ever played against because you couldn't move him around. He used the angles well. Uh, he, he was never in a rush. That was the thing that impressed me the most about him. He was, you couldn't rush him, make him do things fast. George did things at his pace. Yeah, and, but, and he was, Iceman was a lot like the way Oscar was when Oscar played. Oscar yep. was never in a rush either. Very efficient, okay? Never Very rush. Okay, so I can't wait to hear number one. Number one uh, is Larry Bird. And I'm going to say this only out of total respect because Larry knew the game from the ground up. A lot of us, Rick, growing up, knew it from the 
cop up because we're so athletic. You're flying through the sky and you're doing this and throw you lobs and stuff. Well, Larry wasn't a high flyer. So Larry did the things that my high school told, like reverse pivot, forward pivot. Larry was very good footwork. And the thing about him, he was another one that was really, really patient as far as scoring. And he never, uh, he would get flustered sometimes, but this guy could score from underneath, mid range and three point. And what I try to do is take two of those away from you, but I can never take those away. Like with Jordan, I can take away the drive game because I would back off him a little bit because I was long enough to get up and contest his shot. With Gervin, same thing. But Larry, he posts you up, you go inside, but Larry could, Larry could affect the game offensively no matter what was going on on the floor. Gervin and Jordan were only effective when they had the ball. Larry would go get a rebound. He died. I mean, one of the best posters I've, I've ever seen, Rick, was on the side of a bus in 1984. We were playing, and there's it's a long, the, you know how long buses are. They had a picture of Larry stressed out, and right at the fingertip of his fingertip was the ball. And the saying said, I hate when guys watch the ball go out of bounds. I mean, that was so apropos for him because, again, the play against Detroit Pistons. Johnny Mo said, Larry steals the ball. This guy steals the basketball and won the game. Threw it to the DJ, DJ laid in. So Larry was always uh, an effective scorer with or without the basketball. That's why he's number one for me. I got you. Yeah, because yeah, because the thing is, he, he, he's, he's going to run you off or into screens. He's going to make you work hard. He's going to get you lean in one way and go the other way because he understood yep. how to play the game and how – you can take advantage of a great defensive player because all he needs to do is get you leaning just a little bit one way. <laughs> he's going that way and he's going the opposite way and he's got you that half a step. And I always tell people, Coop, I didn't have to beat my man. If I can get you on my shoulder, you're done. And that's what I'm going by you. That you could talk to that because it's not about blowing by somebody or getting wide open. It's just about getting that little edge that you can mm -hmm. – Get your shot off, and you were good at that. I mean, you know, that was another thing that made Jamal Wilson very good. Jamal was tough to guard, too, because it wasn't about getting wide open. It's just about getting that little edge, and great offensive players such as yourself know that. Yeah. So, all right, so now you get a chance to be on, on this Laker team, which obviously become the great Laker team, the Showtime team. What was that like for you? Rick, that's like playing um, – with your neighborhood, like when we were young, I grew up with my grandmother, our family was big, I had a lot of cousins. And there was like six of us. And we used to always go around to neighborhoods and go to the park and play. And we would always play as one team. People would start picking teams. I got this guy, we'd always pick each other. So playing with the Lakers, once, once we started understanding uh, what it took to win. And, and one of the things that the Laker organization bred was that family type of uh, feeling. Once it was like that, like playing with your brothers. Uh, we knew what each of us were going to do just by looking at that person. And I, a lot of, of that credit goes to Pat Riley because that's the way he ran practice and things. And um, it, was, it, it, was, it was amazing. You know, now one thing Pat told us, he said, you guys, in 1985, he said, you guys need to stop and smell the roses because this is going to be over in a minute. And Rick, look, at you've been longer than I have, but I've been 35, 40 years removed from that. And I am so glad that I took him to his word of looking and seeing and smelling. And, you know, our locker room wasn't the greatest smelling room, but I remember that smell in there, that, that camaraderie and that togetherness. And I'm so glad I did that because those memories are still fresh in my mind. Mm. You win. Cyrus, you want to jump in? Well, I was going to say, first of all, Larry Bird calls you the toughest defender he's ever faced. So there's a lot of mutual respect there. You know, Michael, I wanted to jump in and ask you, uh, you know, my, my earliest – or one of my earliest memories of basketball was I was 78 years old. And, um, you know, I grew up in the Bay area, loved the warriors. And this is the 87 team. George Carl was coaching them. Chris Mullen was young emerging at that point, but you guys were a powerhouse. I mean, I, I guess I, I do want to ask if you think that 87 team was the best team you've ever, you've ever played on, but you guys had the warriors of three Oh, in the conference semis series looked over. I mean, you know, you were playing in Oakland in game four and then sleepy Floyd emerges. And I believe you were defensive player of the year that year. He scores 29 in the, in the I believe the third quarter 39 for that half. Those are both still records to this day. 
And, you know, when, when you see all these polls, like what player changed your life in the NBA, you know, people say Jordan, young people say LeBron. I always say Sleepy Floyd. That game just forever just stuck out of my mind. And I was playing CYO basketball and just really invigorated my interest in the game. What was it like being a part of that game? I mean, you won the series the next game, but for you to be defensive player of the year and the Sleepy Floyd just lighting everyone up, like, can just describe that game, please. Well, Moses, I mean, uh, Cyrus, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> it's funny you would bring that game up because that's my nightmare game. That's really? The game that always haunts me. And that's the game that the basketball gods, the basketball god uh, taught us about respect for your opponent. Uh, you know, we were going through that. And like you said, we were pretty good and we, and we, we got too full of ourselves. And there was some, some instances where myself, Byron Scott, Magic Johnson, and I'm very, very shameful to say this, but we were disrespecting uh, Purvis Short, uh, Sleepy Floyd, and instead of playing the game and showing respect to your opponent, we got disrespectful, and uh, that's what happened. And when that blew up, um, that game changed my whole outlook on basketball as far as always having respect for your opponent. And I never, ever did that again. We didn't do anything ugly or vile, but it was just the way that we were handling them. Uh, we would look at them crazy. Like he blocked purpose short and I turn and get in his face, which is a technical today, which I love that the NBA is doing <laughs> things like that. And, and that's the one thing. And, and Pat Wright even said this, he said, you know what? It doesn't matter whether you're the top dog or you're the bottom dog. You always have respect for the fight that's in a dog. And uh, we had lost that respect. And you know what? We quickly got it back. Now, we mm -hmm. went on to win that series. But again, that's a record that stands to this day. And for me personally, it's one I hate it, but I love it. Because it really, it, it really brought me back to, to the, the purest form of this game. Basketball is about respect. Life is about respect. You respect people. And we disrespect it. And, Sleepy to this day, I can't walk by him and see him because he, he never says anything. He just gives you that look like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what I hate the most, that look. But uh, that was a great game. And uh, Cyrus, I'm, I'm mad at you for bringing that up, but I'm, I'm also sorry, mad man. because kids need to hear that. <laughs> I'm sorry, man. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's interesting though, how, how some of the most disappointing things that you did in your career are the ones that stick with you most yeah <laughs> i understand that i mean i remember things like some plays that you know cost us a championship pick two pick and rolls with wilt chamberlain and nate thurman and i mean it's like it happened yesterday it's unbelievable so yeah i can i can i can feel for you in that regard but here's my thing hey coop you'll appreciate this i said nobody ever nobody was ever going to go ahead and score 40 on me because i'll foul out before i let that happen well rick i was trying to foul out i just couldn't get to the guy i was trying to foul out <laughs> let's continue with that because cyrus brought up something which is a question i was going to ask which of the five championship lakers teams that you were on do you think was the best and why uh, Rick, I think there's two of them, and they kind of go hand in hand. I think the first one, when you win one, the first one is always, like, special because in 1980, we weren't playing to win a championship. We were just trying to get our team together and have that camaraderie and that closeness, and we fooled around and found ourselves playing against the Sixers, and, and we won it. But the one that I cherish the most would be 1985 because a kid growing up here in Los Angeles and seeing the Lakers and great Elgin Baylor and Jerry and, and Wilt Chamberlain and – Happy Harrison, just to name a few of those guys, always watching them go and never being able to get over the hump of the Boston Celtics and Jerry being our general manager. And now finally, we thought we had an opportunity to get it in 1984 and we got the shit kicked out of us again in 84. And that whole mystique came back with the Boston jinx. You can't beat Boston. And then we had a chance to repeat and, and get some revenge. That one there, that's because that's like exercise a lot of the ghosts from the 60s and all the Laker teams that never had opportunity to overcome the Celtics. We kind of like helped them out in that aspect. That's the one I cherish the most. Cool. Uh, your favorite teammate? Hmm. That's a good one, Rick. Uh, mm. Magic, Magic is my favorite teammate. My, Magic is my best friend. But I think the guy that I really, really bonded with well is James Worthy. Okay. Hmm. James was kind of like me, down home kid from Gastonia, North Carolina, and just he was just so, so, so mellow and country at the same time. And James, uh, 
uh, he played hard like I did. Not that any of us didn't play hard, but James just had a different mentality about him. And uh, but I, 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 you know, all my teammates were good teammates, but each one had like a special place in my heart and my basketball heart. But James Worthy, I think, would it would be magic and worthy. Those two were the closest guys. I don't know how many people appreciate that. What a voice. James has such a great voice, doesn't he? <laughs> Rick, the guy that puts you to sleep. He sounds like uh, 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 Barry White, you know, that real deep voice. That's one thing I loved about it, too. <laughs> well, I guess you couldn't sleep and now you call his room and say, hey, James, talk to me for a while, will you? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now you, you experience all those wonderful uh, championships with the, with the Lakers. You've got a great career. Your career is over. And you decided to do something that I almost did. I, I almost did because after my last year with the Rockets, uh, they cut the, I don't know if you know this, they cut the rosters to 11 people. I was going to mm -hmm. go play with the Celtics. I was going to play with either the Lakers, the Celtics, or the Sonics. And they cut the rosters to 11. And so the teams didn't want to take me. I was 36 years old. But I knew I could play way better because people think because I averaged 12 and 13 points with the Rockets. I was willing to take a subservient role. as the greatest talented, most talented team I ever played on. And so I never got a chance to do it. I said, so maybe I'll go overseas and play because I, I hadn't felt so good because I had my knee scoped and found a big thing wedged in my joint that I didn't even know was there. First time, no pain in 10 years. So I said, well, maybe I'll go overseas and play. So I almost did it, but I didn't. Okay. Cause the, the broadcasting thing came up for me, which I had studied and I always wanted to do, but you did it. Virtus Roma. Why did you make the decision? And what was that experience like? Well, Rick, I wasn't quite through playing, but I remember, uh, I'll never forget this. Uh, Dr. Buss, the late Dr. Buss, he took me to dinner and uh, he takes me, you know, I'm, I'm 35, I believe then, I'm, you know, uh, he takes me to dinner, feeds me, Rick, this, and we were up in Beverly Hills, one of the most expensive restaurants up there, feeds me, my wife and I, and he's up there with one of his, his young girls and we're sitting there <laughs> talking and just talking, chit-chatting and talking about the season and what, what to look for. And at the end, he goes, uh, Coop, this is why I brought you up here. And I go, so yeah, Doc, what, what's up? He goes, um, I'm going to give you uh Three options. One, we're going to trade you because we're moving on. We're moving forward. Two, you can retire and you can uh, work in the front office. I'll give you a five-year deal in the front office. And uh, three, he says, you can just go off and do whatever you want. Mm -hmm. And I said, uh, okay, retire. Run for five, five, five. So I wasn't ready through the plan. So I remember the next day, we got through the dinner. The next day, he said, just give me your answer in a couple of days. So the next day, I called my agent, let him know what's going on. And he put the word out there. And uh, the Celtics, San Antonio Spurs, and the Denver Nuggets, we got offers from them. Hmm. And Rick, I, I sat and I thought about it. I said, I can't go play for another team because all the things that we have built up through the 80s and stuff, how can you go play with another team? Now you're about tearing that down. And I wasn't ready to retire. I mean, I wasn't ready to finish playing basketball. And right about two days before that, Brian Shaw and Danny Ferry had been overseas and they came back. And I mean, it almost like that this was supposed to happen. They come back, my agent was uh, friends with Danny Ferry and the owner of that team calls and he says, hey, we're here. You know, it calls him to look for another American. He says, hey, Michael Cooper. So he brings it to me, he says, Coop, this team want to pay you, you want to go over it, and they'll give you a two-year deal. And I had been overseas, but just traveling just a little bit. And he's like, Coop, they're going to set you up. And Rick, that, that was a no-brainer. So when I got the contract, I went over. And I'm glad it was Rome, because Rome is kind of like New York, L.A. kind of mix. And um, very biblical. A lot of things in the Bible went on there. And I said, hey, let's go. And I went and pro probably the best experience I've ever had. And my high school coach used to tell me this, Michael, if you play this game the way it's supposed to be played and you fall in love with this game, this game could take many places that you couldn't pay to go. And it did. Uh, basketball has taken me around the world. I'm pretty sure same with you, Rick. So when I went there, one of the best years of my life, man, I took my family. I didn't even come back. I stayed over there the whole year. Got me an interpreter, learned a little bit of Italian. Don't ask me any because it's gone as I got older, it's, it's diminished. <laughs> but um, a, a fantastic time I had, Rick. Fantastic. Great food. And it's so, I, I, see, I love history. I love going over to Rome. I mean, it was yep. really So I, I had almost done that. So, but here's the big question How many points a game did you average? 
when I, when I got there, the, the coach told me, check this shit out, Rick. When I get there, the coach tells me, Coop, I want you to be like magic. <laughs> what? <laughs> I want you to be assist. I want you to rebound. I want you. And uh, it so happens I got uh, Dino Raja. Oh, yeah. Uh, Lottie Divas was the first uh, European player, the first big player in, from their country to come here. Dino was bigger than, 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 uh, than uh, Vlade. But Vladi, Dino didn't come, so that was my teammate. That was the other guy with me over there. So I averaged, um, Rick, I averaged about 18 points a game. I had a high game of uh, 30. Look like 30 was my high, my ceiling. Uh, but I averaged uh, 14 rebounds, and I averaged uh, about eight assists. But check this out, Rick. <laughs> I averaged eight blocks a game. <laughs> oh, eight blocks a game? So I had a lot of fun, and we beat some teams that they had never beaten before. Uh, this team in uh, 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 Varez, they had never beaten this team in like 27 years. We went over there because it was such a homer. The referees are homers over there, Rick. If you go there, <laughs> man, I don't care how great you are, you're not getting a call. If you go to the basket, you got to go score. You're not going to get an and one. But we uh, ended up that team, and that was a highlight. <laughs> oh, yeah, see, that's the thing. But people don't understand. I'm going to point this out so they can have a full appreciation for what you accomplished. It is hard to get eight assists overseas. They don't, they're not generous with assists <laughs> at all, at all, <laughs> at all. So eight assists is unbelievable, but the blocks is insane. <laughs> I mean, that's well, that's, they let me have, I was getting most of those against the, the younger kids over there. You know, you play against some of these kids, they got a, a 18 year old kid out there playing. Cause he's like on their national, one of the national kids that's coming up, going to be on the Olympic team. He's out there. So I mean, I'm blocking their shots and I'm having a good time. I had 15 blocks one game, Rick. <laughs> <laughs> that's crazy that's crazy there's a lot of seven footers that couldn't have 18 blocks no matter who they were playing. <laughs> that's crazy. over there it seems like they're allergic to the end of paint the big guys stay on the outside and it's all the guards cutting through the middle and posting up so that's that's fine. Fine. big guys are out shooting three-point shots nowadays this is really incredible michael cooper is joining us here on warriors 24 and uh, it's been fun to to learn a little bit about what happened with you and your basketball career and so um uh, what made you decide to, to stop playing over there? You obviously were doing well. You were enjoying yourself. You're still young enough to play. Why did you come back? Rick, you know what? I, like I said, I've always played this game for the love of it. And I used to tell myself when I got 33, I said, you know what? I'll just know. And I, I, I don't know why I said this. I said, I'll just know when I don't want to be here. And I always told, uh, and, and, and the fact for me was, I used to love practice, Rick. Practice was fun to me. I, I would get there early leave way, way late, but it was only because I enjoy shooting and I just enjoy the little extra work that you used to do. And uh, so I'm playing over there and it's three games before the end of the season. And the coach comes up to me, he goes, uh, Coop, listen, great season. We're looking to have another one coming back. Uh, Dino, I think is gonna leave and go to, uh, to the Celtics and I'm gonna get another good American to come over here and partner up with you. And he's talking all these good things. And Rick, I remember going home and then the next day I got over there and the coach used to tell me, Coop, you don't have to practice. But I, I, I was a practice person and I, I wanted to practice. I got there, Rick, and I went through practice and I was getting ready to tie my shoes. And I bent over and I was tying my shoe and I stood up and Rick, I didn't want to be there. And something said, this is it. And that's when the, and it was like a, a real feeling that went through me. I said, yeah, this is going to be it. So I got through those last couple of games, and then I knew I knew then that I was it because I didn't want to be there. Divine, divine intervention took place. It, it must have been, but it wasn't about where I was. It was just about I didn't want to be at practice. I just didn't want to practice anymore. And and the guys should tell me, they, <laughs> we're over there playing. They got, they're going two a days the whole season. You practice once, and then on the days off, you practice once, and then you come back at 5 o'clock and practice. And coach was like, Coop, you can either practice once, or you don't have to practice after a game. But I wasn't going to do that to my teammates because I wanted, I didn't want them to, oh, these Americans coming here taking our money, and they're, not, they're just half-assing it. No, I wanted to be part of the team, and that's when I knew. that. I, and So when I finished the season, I come back, contacted Dr. Buss. He, I said, Doc, that deal's still good? He said, yeah. Came back, and that's when they made this, which is now a title, Special assistant to the general manager, Rick. That's a bullshit title. They never, <laughs> they made, they made that title up for me. Okay, J Jerry's the general manager. Mitch Kupchak is the assistant general manager. Why do you need a special assistant general manager? And they made it up for me, and now that's a title in the NBA. From it's amazing. <laughs> there you go. So 
So you were a trendsetter, no question about it. So you did that. You did that for what, like, like three years before you became an assistant coach. Pardon me. You did that for like three years before you became an actual assistant. Before I became assistant coach, Dale Harris was there, and my job was to try to work the defense and go down there. And you know what, Dale Harris uh, was. Um, Dale was a special guy, man. I, you know, he had that. You know Dale, he has that twang and he moved real slow and you thought that was part of his act, but that was him, but he got the most out of that. And fortunately or unfortunately, we came along when they had that team of Nick Van Exel, Eddie Jones, Eldon Campbell, uh, uh, Anthony Peeler, a real dysfunctional group, but athletic as hell, Rick. These kids could play, man, but they just, no basketball IQ. They all thought they belonged there without earning the rights to be there. And it was just terrible. But Dale hung in there, man. And he became coach of the year that year. And Dale gave us all a little plaque that says assistant coaches of the year. And I <laughs> love that plaque to this day, man, because it was so hard coaching them kids. Them guys were just come in late, Rick, forget their uniform on the road oh. or, or their practice stuff. Cause you know, you have to carry, forget their tennis shoes. And I'm like, Dude, this is your job. How are you forgetting this stuff? Why well, can't practice? And, and now it's even worse. So this load management they have in the NBA. Aren't you a basketball player? Don't you want to play every game? Why you need a day off? Unless you're hurt, why do I need a day off on a back-to-back? You're professional. <laughs> you, you, you guys travel charter. It ain't like us, Rick. We had to get up next morning and leave. These guys leave the night of a game. Yeah, first first commercial flight in the morning the next day. <laughs> Yeah, people don't have any idea what it was like, and you had it a lot better than I had it. Trust me. <laughs> <laughs> just to break, just for about three years. <laughs> I know. Well, I did. I did. Hey, I was lucky to just be able to get on the thing where we actually got to fly first class. We, we never even did that. You guys flew first class. Yeah, well, we're, I'm ahead of you in that area. We did get first class though. And <laughs> so, right, you stayed at room regular hotels and had only one room. You didn't have a roommate. No, I didn't have a roommate. Not much. <laughs> tell you, you don't even realize how lucky you had it. And nowadays, it's even crazier for these guys. <laughs> hey, Rick, did your roommate used to smoke? Did your roommate used to smoke? No, it was Al Adels. He didn't smoke, but he used to oh. use magic shave stuff that smelled like rotten freaking eggs. <laughs> Plus, he's a veteran player, and he liked a hot room, man. It was like a freaking sun up in there, and I liked to sleep when it was cold. I had to watch all the bullshit TV shows he wanted to watch. <laughs> I always give credit. And when I tell a story, I said, Al Adels, I said, I'm going to tell you, I give Al Adels a lot of credit for helping me make the play I am today. I said, and it's not why you think. It's because I had a room with him. And I said, shit, I got to play really good so I can negotiate a single room next year. <laughs> uh, unbelievable. But, you, have, you have the three trophies behind you. What are those? If you don't mind me asking. Uh, one is a little one that looks like the uh, NBA trophy. My son won that in, a, in my AAU team. They won that. So that's why I kind of get it there. They because copied the NBA I trophy. took it from, huh? How did they copy that without getting in trouble copying the NBA? I know. Isn't that amazing? But anyway, I keep that one for myself because the team won it. So I keep that for myself because, see, my wife and my son, they're disrespectful around here sometimes. They think <laughs> I'm an old man. So I let them know who I won championships. So that's mine. <laughs> this one here is uh, a trophy I won MVP in a tournament over in Italy uh, in this tournament. So I keep that one. And then this one here, which is this one right here, is another AAU uh, that my son, they, we're runner up. So imagine what the, the championship trophy is like. So I keep those. Love it. All right. So so then, you know, you're with the Lakers and we're kind of going through with Michael Cooper, his uh, his illustrious career as a, as a player and then also as a, as a coach uh, mm -hmm. coaching ranks I, I didn't answer this question why did you decide you wanted to go into coaching because rick i like and 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 you can attest to this as you go through your levels of play starting all the way back to the eighth and ninth grade uh you you come up on different coaches and like i said my high school coach coach person was a fundamental coach. I had a coach, Joe Barnes, who was a chemistry teacher when I got to JC. He was more of an offensive coach. I go to New Mexico. I get Norm Ellenberger, who's an in-your-face defensive coach. I go to Jerry West, and Jerry West was like, you fucking guys get out there and just play, and just play. And Jerry was that kind of coach. Then we get the, uh, Coach McKinney, who's a disciple of Jack Ramsey, and he was real 
uh, fundamental and real basic about things because he wanted to win like they did up in Portland when, when Bill Walton team won the championship. Then we get Pat Riley and Pat was more of attention to detail, discipline, be on time, dress nice. Uh, our plays were run to where it wasn't geared to always one person. Our scouting reports were very detailed and done a kind of unique way. And Pat Riley was the one that really got me to wanting to coach like that. And uh, so when I got my opportunity as an assistant coach and then listening to Bill Harris and on the side uh, and jumping ahead, Rick, a little bit, and then moving into coaching as far as the WNBA, Pat Riley's style with a lot of the other ones mixed in is why I wanted to become a coach. Now, the funny part about coaching is great players don't make good coaches. Good, good players make great coaches. And I wasn't a very, I mean, I was a good player, Rick, but I, didn't, I wasn't a standout on our team. So I thought the next best way that I could pass this thing I have on, this the unique ability to uh, get people to do things, to motivate and to give back to the game of basketball is through coaching. Uh, and what makes coaching special is, and when I got to WNBA, if you can get players to buy into your philosophy, if you get players to believe in what you believe in, if you get players to work hard, and those might be simple things, but it's hard to get a young man. And again, going back to that, that Laker, uh, Nick Van X on Eddie Jones, you can tell them guys to work hard. They weren't going to work hard. But if you can get them to work hard, then you can get things going. And that's what I appreciate about coaching is the ability to get what you got up here, come through here and pass it on to people and see it materialize on the floor. That's a great feeling. Yeah, well, you actually, in a sense, as I told people, you're a salesman. You have to sell yeah. your philosophy right. to your players and get them to buy into that. That's what it comes to. to put it, Rick. But the other critical aspect, and I think you will agree with me on this, and if you don't, you know, please say so, is that I keep telling people the three things that are critical to be successful in pro, in pro team sports. Who do you draft? Who do you get in free agency? Who do you trade for? It's about the players. You got to pick the right players who know the game, who are willing to be unselfish and care about winning and not about themselves. And if you don't get that, I don't care how good a coach you are. You're not going to win. 100% agree, right? Couldn't have said it better. That, I mean, if you don't have players, or you look at some of these guys now and then uh, just crossing sports a little, a little bit, look at Belichick. You know, you don't have that quarterback back there. <laughs> Look at Brady goes to a bad team and turns him into Super Bowl champion. So, yep. and going back to um, Coach Popovich, you don't have the players you used to have like a Tim Duncan and Har and uh, Kawhi Leonard. You don't have them players. I don't care what kind of system you put out there. If you're playing with uh, less than 70% good players, you're going to get 70% wins. And that's not enough to be uh, up to the level that he needs to be now. Well, actually, obviously, the coaching, uh, you know, bug got into your blood because, I mean, you started doing that back in 1999 as that as the assistant. Uh, and then you went to uh, no, actually, you started as an assistant with the Lakers in 96, 94. Then you went as an assistant with the Sparks in the WNBA and then you became the head coach. So what was that experience like coaching the women? Well, Rick, you know what? Uh, coaching in the NBA is a way to bring keep a check coming in. Because <laughs> as an assistant coach, you're just there and going with whatever the coach wants. My job is to keep the guards on time, get them here, get us some shots and like that. But when I became a head coach, that's when it got serious because now everything falls on your shoulders and everything runs through you. And uh, like I said, you hit it right on the head. I had Lisa Leslie, who's probably one of the greatest female players to ever play this game of basketball. I had another player named Delisha Milton who came out of the, uh, she was from Florida uh, and she was kind of like a player like me. We used to call her D nasty. And she was, Rick, this girl was nasty, man. Elbow people for a woman. She was like a Rick Mahorn uh, in, 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 in the WNBA. And then I had this other player named Mawadi Mabika from Congo. Mabika, this girl she... was a female Michael Jordan. Rick, yeah. I kid you not, this girl could shoot like a guy, man. I mean, raise up and just nice form and everything. It took time, but you develop those players, get them to buy into your system like you talked about and get them to understand what team basketball is about. People remember champions. They don't remember people. I mean, they'll remember you if you're great, but it has to be, but if you're a champion, you'll always be remembered. And, you know, that was the greatest feeling I had was to help those women develop into champions and to win a championship. We went back to back. I uh, did something that's very rare. And once the WNBA got started, Lakers won a championship. Then we came that summer and won a championship. 
So uh, it was kind of fun to do that, but that was a unique experience. And I always say this about women, Rick, there's two things I say. I was the luckiest guy in the world because I was married still. I had 16 women, Rick, that all loved me at the same time and weren't <laughs> fighting over me. 16 women. <laughs> so I say, oh, really? Some guys can't even handle one. I had 16 <laughs> of them. And, I, <laughs> had them all. and the second thing I always say about women is uh, I used to love to call timeouts because you know, in a game, Rick, you get in there and James Worthy was a sweater. Shaq was a sweater. And them guys come back in and that funk being there. But you call a timeout with women, they smell so good. And I used to say, come on, y'all get closer, get closer. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god what was it like after the experience there you went from coaching the pros and the women you got a chance then to coach collegiate women what was the difference there well there's a, a a big drop off especially uh because you're fighting against uconn who's the top college stanford uh baylor you know so you're out there fighting and the pool for those women in college are very very small unlike the guys where it's a gigantic ocean but for the pool, it was tough because you have to go out. You know, you have to convince these kids to come to your school. Some of them are back east that want to come out, and it's just a whole process. But that was very difficult because uh, the players that we were getting, it was like they, get, they didn't have the athleticism to be at that level. So you try to get one. But the key is you try to get them all on the same page. And that was a challenge. I really enjoyed it. Um, one thing I liked it because it gives me back to that student athlete thing. That's who you're really recruiting is and showing these young men as well as young women for me, uh, that there is a life after basketball and, and that, uh, uh, you can still put this all together and you try to motivate them to get to the next level. And luckily for me at that time, the WNBA is here. I couldn't imagine Rick coaching these women and there's nothing else left for them, but to go overseas out of sight, out of mind is an old saying. So luckily, the thing that we have is a WNBA, so you can encourage them like you can these guys. And, hey, you want to get to the pros? Come here. I'll show you how to do it. So I was able to get that team up and running, and it was difficult. But eventually, I ended up uh, uh, resigning from there. And the next year, they won the Pac-12 championship. So I like to feel that that's part of mine, too. Yeah, you put the foundation down for them to be able to do that. Yeah. And, then, and of course, are you still coaching Chadwick? Coach at Chadwick, yeah. Um, again, now is that is, is your boy? Are your are you, any of your boys on the team? No, I would never coach my son, Rick. We'd end up fighting, and dinners wouldn't be fun, and being around. <laughs> so no, he goes to Crossroads. But I go to Chadwick, uh, a real high academic school. But the kids come there and they work hard. Uh, we're under undermanned a lot of the time. We're playing against some tough teams. But the one thing we did last year, we won we beat two teams that they had never beaten. So I kind of like that. And the kids are fired up about it. Unfortunately, this COVID hit because it's kind of like stopped everything. But now mm -hmm. we're trying to hopefully have a season next month or in April. Okay, well, good luck with that. And then, of course, I hear and I'm hoping that it happens that the big three comes back because I don't know if you, I mean, that was just fun to see so many guys, guys that you watch playing for me, the older guys who are coaching to hang out and see them. It's, that was a lot of fun. So hopefully we get to do that again this summer. Rick, I'm hearing it's getting close. Uh, you know, they said we might be in a bubble, whether it be here or Vegas. And that's all I'm going to say about it. But if it were to happen, it would be great. Because again, uh, that's a tough group to coach too. <laughs> so oh, oh, yeah. That makes, that makes it the most <laughs> difficult one because actually you don't even get to coach because the captain is really the boss of the team. <laughs> right? And, uh, anyway, listen, hey, I can't thank you enough for taking the time to do this uh, with us. It was, yeah. it was absolutely great. Uh, look forward to seeing you down the road. Hopefully I see you at the big three and I wish, wish you and your family all the best and hopefully the entire country will get back to some sense of normalcy and some sense of life that we can all go out and enjoy ourselves again. Let's hope Thanks, so. Rick. And Cyrus, Mike. thank you. Love both of y'all. Yeah, let's keep it going. Stay safe. Get vaccinated. Do what we got to do because this is going to be over in a minute. And uh, Rick, I'll be ready to coach against you or we'll be able to watch each other coach against each other because like you said, the Capitals get to be the coaches. <laughs> thank you guys so much for having me, man. Appreciate yeah, and, it. And before you go, Michael, people can follow you on Twitter at Showtime Cooper and I believe they can follow you on Instagram at Showtime Cooper 21. Uh, anything else you want to promote before we let you go? Oh, no, that's it. You hit yeah. the both thing. I'm not a big social media person. My wife kind of does that and she'll <laughs> see something and have me something, but you know. <laughs> Uh, thank thanks, you guys thanks. always a pleasure man take care god bless you thank you michael thank you Michael. okay uh again so and cyrus you know this we went very long and but it was it was really fun it, that was uh, it was yeah. great to, to learn about his his life in basketball and what he went through and uh 
That was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed that. We'll have to do more. As far as the Warriors go, let's try to get together and talk a little bit more about them later. I've got to really get on something else. Do your thing, do your thing Rick. It's always a pleasure. We've got a long time already with Michael, so we'll get into talking about that, but you'll get a kick out. I'll just say one thing. So I watched one of the one of the, the games last night, a great win by the Warriors, by the way, coming back from 14 down with not too much time left. Amazing. Amazing. Uh, game before and i watched the play with Embiid setting a two-man game doing some stuff i had the sound off because i really don't like to listen to the sound you know, okay so I, I, I watch i think i watch a different game than what maybe they're watching the broadcasters uh-huh so i had friends here who were over and i said okay let me show you this play and I, my wife said, oh god you're not going to do that i said yes i am so i ran and i stopped this two-man game play it was a two-man game play the screen came from the worst possible angle taking the guy away from the basket the guy there didn't really set the man up properly. The defense didn't communicate, and the big guy was sloughing off and should have been up on the screen to force the guy out wide. There were so many things wrong about it. And then they finally come off, and he comes off the screen. And Embiid moves, as usual, and it, no, no call by the officials, moving screen. Goes to the basket. The player goes up and goes to take a shot, and the defender chased him down from behind, comes up and makes a block. But meanwhile, I sit here. I said, look, and I run it back and show him. Embiid was wide open that he could have dropped and could have had a dunk coming in from the other side. Never even saw him. Guy makes the block. And I told him, I said, I'm going to turn the TV back, run it back, and I'm going to turn the sound on. And I said, I will bet you whatever you want to bet that the only thing that's talked about on this play is going to be the great block by the defender to hustle the man. <laughs> sure as hell, that's exactly what happened. Not talking about any of the other bullshit that takes place in the game. I can't even stand it. I mean, Anyway, that, I, so I just thought I'd throw that out there so I know you'd get a kick out of that. There you go. But I, I, I personally, before we go, I, I'm personally ha very happy with where the Warriors are. I don't know about you. Oh, no, no, they did a great job in this game here. Coming yeah. back, played great move in the ball. Hey, who would have thought, and I don't even know what the final stat was, that they would win with Steph Curry ha shoot, ha being a brick mason from three-point range, who had been shooting 50% from threes, over 50% over the last 10 games, playing out of his freaking mind, and he's a brick mason in that game. But when they needed the really big three mm -hmm. <laughs> overtime, it's like, who hits it? Steph Curry. But that's the whole thing. You can't stop doing what you know you're capable of doing. But nope. if you said before this game, Steph Curry is going to shoot this, are the Warriors going to win? You would say, no way. <laughs> right? Boy, I tell you, they had a couple of a couple of great games by some of the other guys on that team. I mean, some really good efforts. And, uh, yeah, it was fun to watch them play. They did a really nice job. Many guys hurt. Undermanned. Uh, it's, it's, I, I, I mean, Wiseman was really progressing there to see him oh. out for what three weeks now. It's, it's, uh, when is he coming back? I mean, it was like a wrist injury, some fluky little thing, and he's been out for three weeks. But I mean, look, well, I, I love not, really not, not, Draymond. Of course, Draymond's got to be, he's shooting so badly. I mean, he, I mean, I know he brings another element to the team as far as mm -hmm. toughness and all goes, but you know, you know, you got to have some scoring. I mean, they, <laughs> You got, got to have some score once in a while from yeah. some of the people. You can't expect Steph to do it all. I mean, right. it, was, it was a fun game to watch. It was, uh, oh, I, I mean, they have to be so disappointed to lose that game. I mean, they had total, complete control of that uh, of that game. And they oh, my, yeah, I'm sure they're yeah devastated. Yeah, they're having a hard year coming back. Coming, I mean, they wouldn't make the playoffs today. It's kind of crazy. Um, yeah. But I'm thrilled with the Warriors so far. Anyways, uh, everyone can follow uh, Rick on social media at Rick24Barry. You can follow me on Twitter at DogSurfRocho. Rick, always a pleasure, sir. And we'll be doing this again soon. Well, yeah, it was great. We'll talk more about them when we have an opportunity to do it and talk about some of the outstanding play of some of the other players that uh, you know are on the Warriors who are stepping up and getting the job done, which is a, a critical thing um, to you know critical thing to do. No question about it. But I'm going to yeah. look real quick at this box score because before I say goodbye – um the Warriors, the guy that I thought was the star of the game that was out of his mind was Bazemore. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, he oh, led the team, I think, too. Yeah. I mean, he had 26 points, eight rebounds, three assists, but he came up big, big, big for that team. But when's the last time you've seen the Warriors have four guys score 20 or more points in the game? And right, and Steph Curry went five for 20 threes. Amazing. Five. It was great. It was cool. Anyway, all the best to everybody. God bless. We'll look for you the next time and uh, stay well, everybody. See you, Cyrus.